All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Carlo Finelli, and I teach in and coordinate the Work and Labor Studies Program. I'm also a member of the Executive Committee of the Global Labor Research Center here at New York University. I'm delighted to welcome all of you virtually in attendance, the first in a series of five panel presentations organized by John Clark, Hacker Visitor in Social Justice, and co-hosted by the Global Labor Research Center and the Department of Politics. Uh, on behalf of the GLRC, I would like to start by acknowledging and expressing our gratitude to the Indigenous nations who have long-standing relationships with these territories upon which York University campuses are located and that precede the establishment of York University. The area known as Takaranto has long been taken care of by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. For those joining remotely from outside of Toronto, we encourage you to acknowledge and reflect on the Indigenous territory and unique histories of the places where you are located. Before we kick things off here today, I am very pleased to welcome President of York University, Dr. Rhonda Lenton, to say a few words. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour and bonjour. I'm really pleased to see that people have joined us today. And I really wanna begin by just acknowledging uh, all of the presenters um, who at the York's Packer Visitor and Social Justice, John Clark, Charlie Post, Prithitha Krishnan. Um, and in particular, really want to welcome Melanie Panich, the partner of Professor Leo Panich, who of course passed away, people know in December and whom we're honoring today um, with this event. Melanie, on behalf of everyone at York University, I offer my sincerest condolences to you and your family on your loss. Your grief is shared by all of the students, the colleagues, the community members from across York and beyond who miss Leo and his intellect immensely. We're very happy you could join us today. Just to say a few words about Leo, he was an iconic figure on campus throughout his career at York which spanned more than 30 years. He joined the university as a professor of political science in 1984, and he served as both the chair of the department and as a distinguished research professor before his retirement in 2016. He was a renowned political economist, Marxist theorist, and co-editor of the Socialist Register. And he was awarded a Canada Research Chair in 2002 for his study of the role of the United States in leading and managing globalization, which was renewed in 2009. In 1994, he was inducted as a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada for the significant impact of his scholarship and his contributions to the development of the theory of the state in capitalist societies. He was a prolific writer and editor. And in addition to the 33 annual volumes of the Socialist Register that he edited, he authored more than 100 articles and nine books. He was recognized as one of the foremost socialist thinkers of our age, and he had a truly global following. His loss is felt deeply both at York and around the world, and his contributions to socialist thinking will continue to influence political scholarship for many years to come. Indeed, his work will continue to live on in the generations of students and colleagues who he mentored, guided, guided, and inspired. And as a sociologist myself, I can tell you that the impact of his work went far beyond Marxist theory, political economy, well into um, you know, other disciplines and, and had the pleasure of um, reading some of Leo's works as well. It's very fitting that we're honoring Leo today at the Packer Seminar since Leo played such a divisive role, a decisive role in developing the Packer Committee. The Packer Seminar series, with its focus on social justice, builds on the work that Leo undertook throughout his career to create a more equitable world. I wanna thank John Clark for organizing the series and for his dedication to honoring Leo's legacy. Thank you, everyone. Merci, miigwech. Thank you, Dr. Lenton, for your kind words to get things going. Uh, next, I'm happy to introduce today's moderator. Dr. A.J. Withers is a longtime anti-poverty organizer in Toronto. They are the co-author with Chris Chapman of A Violent History of Benevolence, Interlocking Oppression in the Moral Economies of Social Working. 
and also author of Disability Politics and Theory. More information on Dr. Withers' work can be found at stillmyrevolution.org. Dr. Withers. Thank you, Carlo. Um, and I first wanna just invite people to, if you want to use them, turn on the closed captions in the toolbar below. Um, I also wanna recognize the life and passing of Leo Panich. I knew Leo a little bit through social justice organizing in Toronto and as someone who came to support the picket lines of QP 3903. Um, and throughout the panel, I invite people to post questions to one or all of the panelists in the question and answer section and also in the tools at the bottom. We have some amazing panelists today. Uh, John Clark and Charlie Post are here and hopefully Kavita Krishnan will be joining us shortly. The first speaker is John Clark. His talk is titled, The Pandemic Has Unleashed a Deep Crisis in Society. John has spent 28 years working as an organizer with the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty, OCAP, and was involved in an ongoing effort to challenge austerity, poverty, and homelessness. He is presently the Packer Visitor Chair, as you've heard, in social justice at York University. So I welcome you, John. Thank you so much, AJ. Um, <clears throat> I, I think it's necessary to begin what I say by also some, saying something uh, about uh, about Leo Panitch. And it, it really is that, I mean, there's so many things that I could say, and we dealt with each other in lots of different ways uh, over the years. Um, but uh, I came in as the Packer visitor for social justice from uh, a very much a non-academic and, and a social movement background. And I would just like to say how thoroughly supportive and helpful Leo was in that regard, in terms of me coming into the position and in terms of ways in which we tried to develop this. Uh, and we didn't have enough time to, uh, to, to, do, to do it as, to do the things together that we wanted to do on it, but it was enormously, Leo played an enormously important role and I, respected him uh, and liked him enormously. Um, I, I think I want to, uh, to say that this panel series uh, is going to look at some of the, uh, is going to look at some of the key struggles that are taking place in the face of the enormous crisis that has been triggered by the, uh, by the pandemic. Um, and it's going to look at very concrete struggles that are unfolding, but today we're going to focus on a sort of a general overview of, uh, of what we're up against, which I think is enormously important. Um, I'm going to begin, I think, by trying to challenge uh, what I could consider to be a prevailing, uh, perhaps even an official discourse with regards to what we're dealing with. Um, the notion is put forward that this inexplicable virus that came out of nowhere suddenly created this enormous problem of public health, and as a result, caring governments having to enact measures of physical distancing, uh, people uh, ha have suffered an enormous economic reverse. But rather like a, a, a summer resort, uh, once the uh, once the season gets back underway, everything will be booming again, and there'll be no problem. We'll, we'll all be back to normal. And I think it's necessary to uh, to challenge that. Um, first of all. Uh, I think it's fairly clear that the pandemic, in fact, didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, and you don't have to go to radical but critical, uh, but credible analysts like uh, Rob Wallace or Mike Davis. Uh, you can go to the United Nations. You can go to a whole series of very mainstream scientific bodies to understand that the pandemic was entirely predictable. Um, but it, uh, it came out of industrialized forms of agriculture. It came out of the destruction of habitat. It came out of the enforced proximity of domestic animals and humans to wild species of animals. And um, if, you, if you look at the UN's biodiversity panel and their report, they conclude not only was the pandemic predictable, but other pandemics are enormously likely. That they, as we put it, have entered into the pandemic era. 
And, and I would suggest that this pandemic era is unfolding in the context of a broader series of interwoven crises uh, within, uh, within global capitalism itself. Um, the economic crisis that we now find ourselves facing, um, I think we need to also reject the notion that this is just something that happened because of the pandemic. Um, there were already factors at work that were, that were producing an economic crisis um, that the pandemic certainly triggered and the pandemic certainly intensified that crisis, but there's a lot more to it than that. Coming out of the 2007-2009 uh, period uh, of the uh, financial crisis and the Great Recession, uh, you then see a sluggish recovery with a failure to restore rates of profit and a failure to restore levels of productive uh, investment. Um, the, the British uh, economist Michael Roberts uh, puts it this way. He says that the world economy was heading into a slump in 2020 anyway. The pandemic was the trigger to speed that up and deepen it. You could think of the coronavirus as a tipping point in this scenario. It could have been something else. In that sense, the pandemic is not some exogenous shock, but is actually integral to the crisis. Um, and Roberts talks within a global context there, but if you took the work of, uh, say, Jeff McCormick and uh, Todd Gordon, uh, you get exactly the same picture with regards to the, uh, the Canadian situation. And so after the pandemic ends, and that now with the various forms of mutant strains that are emerging is uh, itself an enormously unknown question, but after that it ends, we will still be dealing with those same contradictions, that same underlying crisis, but we will also be dealing with what the IMF and others have referred to as economic scarring. Uh, and that's a very sort of a, a very measured term, but uh, the scarring that is taking place at this moment is absolutely enormous. Uh, I see a report in the, uh, in coming out of the UK right now, talking in terms of 7 million jobs being on the line if a series of zombie companies go down in the immediate period. Uh, globally in poor countries, the crisis has had a devastating effect. Um, uh, Oxfam puts it this way, combined with ongoing conflicts, spiraling inequality, and an escalating climate crisis, the pandemic has shaken an already broken food system to its foundations, leaving millions on the brink of starvation. Uh, the United Nations towards the end of last year was predicting an 82% increase over the previous year in what they call crisis level hunger, uh, affecting, they suggested, uh, an absolutely horrendous 270 million people. Um, just yesterday, uh, there was a picture circulating of a food bank lineup in Glasgow in Scotland that was uh, profoundly shocking. And similar pictures have been seen in the wealthy countries of the world. Um, in the United States, um, after the Great Recession or during the Great Recession, financial crisis, uh, it's estimated about 12 million people lost their housing in a crisis that was centered on housing in many, many ways. Predictions now talk in terms of 40 million people at risk of being evicted from their housing in the United States. Um, in this city, in, in the city of uh, Toronto, um, 35,000 households are at immediate risk of eviction. The provincial government has established an online uh, eviction procedure uh, that is a mockery of natural justice. Um, evictions have been put on hold during the present lockdown, but not the eviction proceedings. So when that's lifted on February 22nd, we may expect uh, another um, tsunami of evictions. Um, so I don't think, so in this situation, uh, we're seeing a lot of hopes that uh, we're gonna turn the corner soon. Uh, and as in 2009, uh, there's predictions of a kind of a new golden age of Keynesianism. Um, but I don't think that's, uh, that's a valid assumption, uh, even with the best efforts of, the, uh, uh, of those promoting the Biden administration in the United States. I don't think that that's a, a realistic, uh, a realistic uh, assumption. Um, 
I think we're going to continue to deal with uh, we're going to continue to deal with a situation where uh, that economic scarring and those underlying factors are going to continue to drive a very very challenging and a very very difficult situation. Um, it's certainly true that during this period of unprecedented public health crisis, when sections of the economy had to be shut down, that governments have taken measures of stimulation to keep things uh, going. And it's, uh, that certainly happened. We had the CERB here in Canada and other such uh, measures being taken. Um, but I don't think it's realistic to imagine that we are about to see a global post-war uh, Nordic model put in place. I think we are going to see, we're going to be in a situation where in the period ahead, because of the enormity of the crisis, because of the enormity of the outlay, outlays by government, the question that's going to be posed is who's going to pay for the, uh, for the crisis? And that really, I think, raises questions very valid to this whole panel series of what kind of struggles are going to be necessary in the, uh, in the period ahead. Um, the first thing I think it's necessary to say, not to a, for a moment to understate the difficulties that we face and the problems that we face, is that there's no reason to imagine that we're looking at uh, necessarily a period of shocked passivity. Um, following the, uh, while the pandemic was already underway, following the police killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, you saw an enormous mobilization around racial justice questions uh, that was uh, inspiring in the United States and spread uh, internationally. Um, uh, in India, you see uh, a general strike and then a farmer's movement uh, that has shaken the Modi government uh, profoundly. So. I think we're in a period when we can talk in terms of real struggles, uh, real struggles breaking out. Um, and in that situation, it really poses questions about how we need to orientate. Um, I think, uh, and I speak from the standpoint of someone who, as AJ pointed out, I sort of went through 28 years as an OCAP organizer in the sort of the trenches of the ongoing defensive war against neoliberal austerity. Um, one of the striking things I've always thought about that whole period that was really, really, really important and really significant was that in the earlier post-war period, you had uh, a situation of, of a relatively conciliatory period a period in which uh, improvements in social programs were being put in place, trade unions were recognized and dealt with in ways they hadn't been before. And then along comes this change of course, this neoliberal agenda, and people find their unions under attack, they find social cutbacks happening, but it was a relatively incremental process. There were certainly Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher and Mike Harris here in Ontario, but it was a relatively incremental process. And with some important exceptions, the sort of the edifice of compromise remained in place. Uh, trade unions generally only went on strike locally uh, at the end of collective agreements. There were no generalized, there were, there were, there were generalized strikes, but they were the exception. Uh, explosive, large social movements, such as we've seen at an earlier period, were much more rare in that period. But I, I, I rather suspect that the situation we're in now is seeing such an incredible change for the worst in people's lives that those edifices of compromise are no longer sustainable. I think we're in a situation where a return to much more explosive forms of social struggle are, are in the works. Now, that isn't something that you just sort of you sit on the station and wait for the train to show up. Uh, it involves, of course, uh, conscious intervention. It involves, all, it involves all of those things. But we're in a period now, I think, when, um, when in response to this crisis that none of us, the like of which none of us have ever seen in our lives, we're now in a situation where it's a time to really think boldly. If we're talking about strategies for social struggles and social movements, it's a time to think very, very boldly. It's a time to think of bold strategies and tactics, and it's a time to think in forms of, in terms of dynamic and democratic forms of organization and really bold uh, transformational uh, policies. Uh, even the opinion polls, 
suggest an enormous level of dissatisfaction, uh, a seething sense of grievance. And in this period ahead, I think we have to really challenge the notion that we just simply want to return to the normality of, of what came before the pandemic. During, to use one final example, during the period of the um, during the period that the pandemic has hit, we have seen a degraded healthcare system in Ontario. We've seen it just unable to deal with the enormity of the situation because it has been weakened so profoundly. And we've seen long-term long care facilities where 1,800 people die in the first wave of the pandemic. And then they sit uh, and allow those largely privatized death traps to make no changes really of any substance. And the second wave hits and it's equally devastating. That's appalling and that's shameful. And I think that kind of thing is sending shock waves through society. And so if we're talking about social struggles and we're talking about, uh, uh, about social movements, and if we're talking about challenging the status quo, I think we're in a situation like none of us have ever seen. And it's time to think on those terms and it's time to organize and respond accordingly. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. Um, that was in insightful and inspiring and uh, you even really riled up Stewie here. <laughs> um, our next speaker is Charlie Post. Charlie will be speaking about political polarization in the U.S., challenges and paradoxes facing the U.S. left. Charlie teaches sociology at the Borough of Manhattan Community College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He is active in the faculty union is a member of the Tempest Collective and the editorial board of Spectre. Charlie has published among others in Jacobin, International Viewpoint and Historical Materialism. Charlie. Okay, well, I also wanna start by acknowledging the passing of Leo Panitch. I got to know Leo a bit uh, in the 2010s when I was involved with and published a couple of articles in the Socialist Register and while Leo and I would have occasionally rather sharp political and theoretical discussions, his, he was always comradely and principled in his, the way he debated and discussed things. And his passing is a loss, not only for the Canadian, but for the international left. Now, since Joe Biden was declared the winner of the presidential election, on November 7th of last year. The mainstream media in the United States and around the world has proclaimed a return to normalcy in US politics. The vast majority of the capitalist class in the US, along with the majority of middle-class public opinion, <clears throat> hope that the removal of Trump from office and perhaps an impeachment trial that will ban him from public office for life will end the polarization that have disrupted the normal workings of capitalist politics in, this, in the United States. While the top leaders of both the Democratic and Republican parties look forward to a new period of civility, if not cooperation in implementing what will be, I think, a continuation of neoliberal rather than Keynesian economic and social policies. The reality is that the social roots of the polarization that has gripped the capitalist world since and the US since 2008 2009 remain in place. Since the onset of the glo prolonged global economic slump in 2008, the entire capitalist world has seen in a very sharp political pro polarization. Across the world, we have seen the rise of both a more aggressive electoral populist right with a minoritarian fascist wing of street fighting thugs and the episodic explosion of anti-capitalist, anti-racist, and working class struggles. The electoral growth of right-wing populist parties equally hostile to globalism and Muslims, immigrants, and organized workers across the world has had its US manifestations in first the Tea Party and later Trumpism. The growth of these electoral parties has provided the space for the growth of violent street fighting gangs. In the US, we saw their mobilization in Charlottesville in 2017, 
followed by a string of assaults and murders. These fascist elements have been in the forefront of the fight to reopen the economy in the US and abroad, opposing the shutdown, social distancing, and vast mass vaccination campaigns that aim to contain the pandemic. Now, the rise of the far right, clearly, as John has indicated, has not gone unchallenged. There have been periodic upsurges on the left. In 2011, we saw the first wave of resistance, the movement of the squares in Europe, the Wisconsin uprising in Occupy in the US. In the past three years, we've seen a return of mass strikes across the capitalist world. These strikes, as my co-editor Spector Dave McNally pointed out in an essay on the return of the mass strike in our first issue, have been spearheaded by teachers and nurses, predominantly women, spurred to action by the deepening crisis of social reproduction. Private sector workers, while not yet as combative as public sector workers, have not been absent as evidenced both by private sector healthcare strikes and by the General Motors, the UAW strike against General Motors in the United States. The strike has again become the common parlance of a wide variety of social struggles well beyond the workplace, including women's strikes in defense of reproductive freedom against sexual harassment and violence and for equality at the workplace and broader society. Nor has the pandemic ended social struggles as the globalization of the anti-racist uprising that began in the US this summer resonates around the world. These struggles were given a highly mediated and rather indirect representation electorally with the rise of left-wing social democratic politics, Syriza in Greece, Mélenchon in France, Corbett in Britain, and the Sanders campaigns in the United States. Now, the prolonged crisis of capitalist profitability that John referred to that began in 2008, 2009, and whose latest manifestation is the global recession of 2020, which is, again, as John pointed out, began actually weeks before the pandemic hit, is the root cause of this polarization. While the neoliberal economic boom of 1983-2008 brought stagnating li living standards and working conditions for most people, the 2008-2009 recession dashed the hopes of broad sections of the population that things would eventually get better. With the traditional organizations of working people, unions, social democratic and labor parties and the like, weakened and conservatized after four decades of neoliberal assault, the populist right has been the main beneficiary of this polarization. Segments of the traditional middle classes of small business people facing bankruptcy and of the middle class of low level supervisors and managers facing downward mobility are the main social base for the new populist right in both its electoral and street fighting forms. Despite the liberal media's droning on about Trumpism being the revenge of the so-called white working class, Trump voters and most of the gangs that assaulted the US Capitol on January 6th have been drawn from the ranks of what we call the petty bourgeoisie. It is true that a minority of workers and particularly older white male workers have been drawn to the far right. As unions and other organizations of collective struggle against capital have weakened, a minority of workers across the world have attempted to defend their declining social position at the expense of other workers people of color, immigrants, women, queer folks, leaving these workers open to the appeals of the populist far right. Now the installation of the Biden administration will not restore normalcy, the hegemony of a new neoliberal center with some, uh, shall we put it, Keynesian co uh, costuming. In fact, the events of the past few months point to even greater political and social instability. Not only are the deep roots of the economic crisis unresolved and the pandemic far from over, but we are seeing an unfolding crisis of political capitalist political representation in the United States. Trumpism, like the Tea Party, never had support of any significant sector of the capitalist class in the United States. Only a small minority of capitalists backed Trump in 2016. He received a mere 8% of total corporate contributions in his initial bid for the presidency. While his tax cut and deregulation of energy exploration won him more support by 2020, key sectors of capital have always been uneasy with his anti-globalization rhetoric 
and his mishandling of federal pandemic response. Trump's willingness to openly flirt with the fascist right, culminating in the open encouragement of the beer gut putsch on January, 20, January of 2021, led to a decisive break. No sector of capital, including those that had tolerated Trump, were willing, ready to abandon the constitutional order that had allowed capital to maintain its rule for over 200 years. All of the major organizations of the capitalist class in the United States, the Business Roundtable, the US Chamber of Commerce, and the National Association of Manufacturers condemned the attempt to block Biden's electoral college victory. Large swaths of capital, including those traditionally tied to the Republican Party, are threatening to withhold contributions, the lifeblood of US politics, from any Republican elected official who attempted to overturn the elections or are tied to the open white supremacist militias and fascist groupings. Now, the fascist right in the US does not at the moment have the support of any sector of the capitalist class. As January 6th made clear, they are far from posing a threat to the routines of capitalist democracy. However, these forces have grown in number and confidence under the Trump administration. Despite temporary setbacks, they will continue to pose a threat to a left that is committed to rebuilding working class organization in workplaces and communities, fighting racism, defending immigrants, and opposing sexism and homophobia. The fascist minority and their sympathizers among the considerable portion of the Trump electorate pose a real problem for the Republican Party. The oldest and most reliable party of productive capital in the world is faced with a, a dilemma. Do they bow to capitalist pressure and renounce Trump, or do they appeal to their most reliable voters among the right-wing populist middle classes? The Democratic Party, which has marginalized the influence of the labor officials and mainstream women, leaders of women's, people of color, LGBTQ, and immigrant groups since the Clinton administration in the 1990s, is well situated to fill this vacuum. The Harris and Biden administration are fully committed to reopening the economy safely. They want to put the resources of the federal government behind a massive vaccination campaign spending billions preparing public schools to reopen quickly, freeing millions of working class parents to work in New York. And in fact, it is democratic mayors in big cities across the United States, like Lori Lightfoot in Chicago and Bill de Blasio in New York and elsewhere who are in the vanguard of pushing for school reopening. While providing less indirect economic relief to workers and small business people than Trump actually provided last March. Biden have and Harris have embraced the pro-immigration reform proposals, a path to citizenship for the undocumented combined with a guest worker program, and a racial justice that will create more justice agenda, excuse me, that will create more opportunities for people of color owned businesses and managers while doing nothing to address the endemic police violence mass incarceration, and growing poverty among working people of color. Finally, they have a plan to reestablish US imperial hegemony over the world and to contain China in particular as a potential rival economically and materially, militarily. While the Democrats may be able at least temporarily to win the support of majority of capitalists, they will not, as John pointed out, be able to end the recession, radically reduce unemployment, stem racist police violence, or prevent the US military adv adventures abroad. Will the left in the US be able to begin building an effective alternative, both to right-wing populist nationalism and the neoliberal center? Can we turn workplace actions of last spring into a union victory at the Amazon warehouse in Bessemer, Alabama, and revive strike action in both the private and public sectors? Will we build a new unemployed workers movement capable of taking direct action in response to continued unemployment and a looming tsunami of evictions? Can the left find a way to coalesce with radicals of color committed to abolishing and defunding the police to build an ongoing movement against racism? And finally, is the left in the US ready to mobilize to outnumber, overwhelm, and disperse the fascist right whenever it takes to the streets? 
There had been hopeful signs since 2017. Most importantly, the exponential growth of democratic the Democratic Socialists of America, of which I am a member. For the first time in over 40 years, socialist politics has become again the lingua franca of the American left. And socialists were playing an important role in organizing demonstrations against the Muslim bans, the border wall, the barbaric caging of children at the border, in anti-fascist mobilizations, and especially in several of the major teacher strikes across the country in 2018. However, the new socialist left has been unable to play a consistent role in mass struggles, helping to consolidate mass independent organizations of struggle. DSA as an organization was caught backfooted by the anti-racist uprising of 2021. Individual DSA members came out to the demonstrations in the wake of George Floyd's murder and some branches and working groups where left-wing elements in the Afro-Socialist Caucus were active, have developed relations with black and brown police abolitionists. However, DSA nationally did not develop a strategic orientation to the uprising and has failed to help build an ongoing national organization to continue education and agitation around defunding the police. At best, DSA chapters have taken up defund the police campaigns as part of their advocacy for Democratic Party candidates, while others have rejected the call for defunding the cops and again are instead calling for substituting defending, uh, taxing the rich. Now, I believe that the roots of DSA's failure to consolidate an activist left in the anti-racist struggles and their near total abs abstention from anti-fascist organizing in the last seven, eight months is rooted in what we can call their electoralist political orientation. While DSA continues to support efforts to organize essential workers with the United Electrical Workers and organizing restaurant workers, the vast majority of DSA's organizational resources and membership activism have been channeled into promoting socialists and radicals running as members of the Democratic Party. The Sanders campaign sucked up most of DSA's energy in the first few months of 2020. After the Sanders campaign collapsed, DSA doubled down on its electoral commitments, in particular on down ballot non-presidential campaigns. Key leaders and many members actively campaigned for Biden, despite the 2019 DSA convention's overwhelming vote to support no candidate other than Sanders in 2020. In the past few months, some in DSA have declared Democratic Party electoral politics the main arena for building working class organization and radicalism. They argue that because mass movements, strikes and the like are episodic, electoral politics through the Democratic Party is both the main way to win reforms and to promote radical consciousness and organization. Unfortunately, this electoralist perspective profoundly misunderstands the differing and often contradictory dynamics of building mass working class struggles and electoral activity, especially when that electoral activity is carried out through the capitalist democratic parties. Electoral campaigns that seek solely to win office, which is the case even with socialists running in the democratic party, have a very different logic than mass struggles and have a markedly different impact on working people's power, organization, and consciousness. Mass struggles, uprising to defend the police, rent strikes, workplace struggles, aim to build direct confrontational action to win concessions from capitalists in the state. To be successful, these struggles require people organizing to take dangerous, and often illegal actions, which carry the risk of the loss of jobs, housing, arrest, imprisonment, and physical abuse by the police. In the course of building such action, significant minorities of working people develop ideas to make sense of their increasingly militant practices as they reach, our, reach across racial and gender divisions to build solidarity, they become open to anti-racist and feminist ideas. As they confront the bosses in the state, they begin to understand that capitalism is the problem 
and that the state and law are not neutral, but usually arrayed on the sides of their enemies. Mass movements that involve direct action and confront capital in the straight have the capacity to build power, radical consciousness, and ongoing organization across the heterogeneous working class. Radicals and socialists have much to offer in these struggles, both in terms of organizing skills and political ideas. Crucially, it is mass disruptive movements and are not electing friendly politicians to office that have been crucial to the gains won by working people in the US and across the world. Campaigns to elect even socialist candidates as Democrats have a very different dynamic. Winning an election does not require risk-taking, building solidarities, or developing radical ideas about the world. To win an election, you need to appeal to 50% plus one voter and get them to the polls on election day. Not only do the people you organize remain isolated and passive voters, not active participants in their own liberation, but electoral campaigns must appeal to voters' existing consciousness. When working class organizations of all sorts are weak and most working people have limited or no experience of successful collective action, their existing, common, their existing consciousness is usually a common sense mixture of radical and reactionary ideas. To win a majority, politicians must appeal to the lowest common denominator consciousness, often avoiding radical ideas about policy or struggle. Excuse me. This is why even Bernie Sanders, the self-proclaimed socialist, did not embrace either the demand to defund the police or unconditionally support all aspects of the Black Lives Matters uprising, especially those that involved lawbreaking. Put simply, people do not learn the skills or politics needed to build mass disruptive social movements through participation in conventional political, conventional electoral politics. Finally, the election of progressives and radicals to office have bought few gains for working people, unless accompanied by independent upsurges. In their absence, leftists in office are likely to implement austerity and launch attacks on the worker, working and oppressed peoples, as the experience of left governments from Francis Mitterrand regime in 1981 to Greece's Syriza in 2016 have made clear. Clearly, radicals should not abstain from all electoral activity. Socialists have long utilized the electoral sphere to give a broad political voice to the struggles of working and oppressed people. Such campaigns prioritize popularizing the demands and activities raised in mass struggles, not necessarily winning office. Candidates must be accountable to the independent organizations of working people that organize their campaigns and resist the pressure on all elected officials to be, quote, realistic and accept the limits of the existing social order. Such campaigns, even in support of open socialists, cannot be run in the US Democratic Party, whose program, finances, and structure ensure the domination of corporate interests. Clearly, the stakes for independent socialist electoral campaigns in the US today is limited, mostly to one party cities and congressional districts in which a third party candidate would, cannot be accused of being a spoiler. While such campaigns prefigure the independent, nationally organized working class political party the US has never seen, it will require new upsurges of struggle in mass organization, probably on the scale of that we last saw in the 1930s for such a new party to come into existence. Only when a significant minority of working people experience their collective power and organization outside the electoral arena, will they be willing to quote, waste their vote on an independent labor or socialist candidate who does not have an immediate chance of winning. So to sum up, the challenge for the US left today to take advantage of the crisis of the Republicans, the, fit, the inability of the Democratic Party to address the ongoing crises, the, the growth of right-wing populism, the fascist menace, et cetera, will really depend on whether or not this new left, and in particular Democratic Socialists of America, decide to prioritize the sort of mass 
organizing, prioritize relating to these periodic mass struggles and to play a organized and conscious role in these mass explosions that we can expect to see, or whether they will continue on their path of a deeper and deeper orientation to Democratic Party electoral politics, which has always been the graveyard of the left and social movements in the US for most of the last century. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlie. Um, I wanna invite folks to post questions in the question and answer and I'll um, bring them to the panelists. And um, we've heard from Kavita and she's unable to make it today. And I want to encourage people to look at the event page and check out her bio and, and look up the pretty amazing work that she's doing. Um, I'll just start out with a question for both John and uh, Charlie. So both of you have um, touched on these sort of periodic uprisings or resistances on the left in the past while. And I'm wondering what you think is needed or would be helpful to bring sustained or more victorious resistance on the left and, and relatedly um, what your thoughts are with respect to electoral politics, John. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I mean, yes, I mean, that seems to be, that seems to be the great, the great uh, political difficulty uh, that, that that this present period shows, going back over over a whole period of time, uh, is that you get explosive struggles, um, but the system is able to, uh, by a combination of repression and concession, uh, keep keep the lid on the situation, and that can be something as massive as the Arab Spring. Uh, it can be uh, it can be the Black Lives Matter struggles breaking out in the United States uh, last year. Think back to the uh, uh, incredibly uh, economically disruptive struggles that were taking that were taken up uh, when the RCMP moved in against the Wet'suwet'en land defenders in 2019. Um, uh, you know, I mean, you had a situation where uh, the rail system within the country was brought to a halt. You had cargo vessels lined up out in the Pacific Ocean because they couldn't get in because of the, the there was a real glimpse given of, 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 of strength. Um, so, I, I mean, I think in the period ahead, uh, we see certainly the objective situation in terms of the, the level of hardship and dislocation that's being forced on people in a certain sense speaks to the needs to maintain levels of struggle i think that's certainly true but that in and of itself is not is never going to be is never going to be enough um so i think first of all i i think just organizationally in terms of the movements themselves um and, and, and it, whenever struggles break out you always begin to get this notion of the assemblies you always begin to get this notion of people looking grappling for uh, forms of organization that are dynamic and democratic. And that seems to me to be something that would be enormously important, something that the political left should uh, constantly try to inject into, into movements of struggle. Um, I mean, in, in the present situation where you have this combination of a need to resist government measures to deny uh, or to prematurely open uh, up uh, economic activity and spread the pandemic. And on the other hand, you have lockdowns where people are not getting the support that they need in order to survive. The need for communities to find co cohesive ways of organizing uh, seems to me to be really, really important. Uh, I also think, uh, however, uh, I, I certainly don't wish to promote the notion of the invariable, stodgy, stereotyped uh, vanguard. But I do believe that, that there is a real role for conscious left uh, political intervention. And we don't have, I mean, I would go back and think of the 1930s. I mean, 
being someone that's been involved in anti-poverty and unemployed workers struggles a great deal. It's something I've given a lot of thought to and paid a lot, a lot of attention to. And I would say there were very big problems with the Communist Party in the 1930s in terms of its orientation. But actually, the ability of organizers in the Communist Party to go into and play a real role in terms of organizing in, in communities affected by unemployment, uh, in however distorted a form, you can see, the, uh, you can see where that went uh, and you can see the, the possibilities there. So uh, an intervention by, uh, even if it's a question of a sort of a united left uh, intervention, but you see actually uh, respectful participation and the advancing of strategies and ideas that can give movements more sustainability and more durability. I think that's uh, that's really critical. And with regards to electoral politics, finally, I, I would largely uh, overwhelmingly agree with what uh, with, the, with the position that Charlie was putting forward. I mean, I, I think that uh, I think that the notion that it is inherently wrong to participate in elections uh, is is a is a mistaken idea. I think they do play a, they do play an important role, but they also become a swamp, and they also become. They, it's also I think absolutely necessary to ensure that the social movement, social mobilization component is put way way ahead of the electoral strategy. Uh, I think it's far more important that people mobilize, and electoral politics complement that. And you get lots of people who say yes. I mean. The Corbyn period in the Labour Party, there was lots of talk about uh, about the need to make the Labour Party a social movement and uh, and uh, be linked to struggles going on. Uh, but uh, in practice, electoralism increasingly asserted itself within that uh, within that initiative to a degree that had a, a stultifying effect and a disastrous effect for the Corbyn leadership as well. I might uh, I might add. Um, I mean, an example that occurred to me recently in something I wrote was um, the NDP leader, Jagmeet Singh, uh, has mistakenly, in my view, uh, suggested, uh, put forward to the Liberals, and they responded, the idea of placing the Proud Boys on the terrorism list. Uh, I think that was a big mistake. But um, imagine, uh, it's uh, perhaps not something that too many people would consider very likely, but imagine if the NDP, instead of advancing that strategy and asking them to sort of add, add a, a fascist group to a list of, to, to the terror list, how about instead if the NDP had used its riding associations and used its contact to the trade union movement to try to actually build a social mobilization against the Proud Boys and other, and other forms of, of, of fascist mobilization. I mean, I don't think they're likely to do it. I think it's going to have to be done from the, from the ground up by, uh, by uh, anti-racists and by, uh, by socialists and by other anti-capitalists. But, uh, but the truth is that that, um, that uh, is an example, I think, of the way in which uh, an electoral initiative could potentially uh, be linked to a strategy of social mobilization. Um, I won't say any more about ele electoral politics. I think John gave a really good example of what that might look like, unlikely as it will be given the sort of scoliosis of the NDP in Canada. But I think I want to address the the Quest, the this question of what what does the left what should the left be doing between these big upsurges to give this greater continuity and to ensure greater capacity to actually win make gains and build people's working people's confidence that struggle is the way forward and I think here it's finding ways to organize the militant minority, the, the, the actual vanguard, not the self-proclaimed people selling uh, strange newspapers at meetings, et cetera, but her, who the actual uh, the activists who want to continue the fight between these, between these big upsurges. And John gave the example of the Communist Party in the 30s, their role in the unemployed movement, and particularly for the first several years of the industrial workers upsurge in the United States, they, along with left-wing members of the Socialist Party, Trotskyists, uh, former uh, syndicalists, et cetera, all came together around a common set of politics that workers needed to 
create their own organizations, democratically run unions, willing to take strikes, not rely on the federal government, et cetera, organize independently of the union officials, et cetera. If you look at the 1960s and you look at the civil rights and black power movement, several organizations for whatever, and whatever crit political criticisms we have of them in retrospect, play this role of maintaining a, 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 net, a network of activists and organizers who can be prepared, lead the movement between upsurges and be prepared to give those upsurges direction. In the late 50s, early 60s, this role was played by the Southern Christian Leadership Council, increasingly in the 1960s by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, later by other organizations. What the left, for me, what the left in the U.S. needs to be doing is, a, is trying to hook up with, to develop relationships and build these sorts of organizations like a new SNCC. There's some, for example, if DSA and many of the newly radicalized African-American and Latino activists who began to organize around defund the police, have been able to pull together a national organization dedicated to police abolition and ca continuing campaigns around the defunding the police. This would have served on as a, a tremendous counterweight to the pull of so many of the active activists and organizers in the up anti-racist upsurge into the Democratic Party, into electoral politics, and away from continued organizing and struggle. So it's re the role of the left, as John put it in here, we, we are in 100% agreement, is to help coalesce new organizations of this militant minority, whether it's in anti-racist struggles, anti-fascist struggles, unemployed in housing struggles, in workplaces, et cetera. That's our task, to build these organizations that can act independently of the Democrats, the official leaders of the labor movement, et cetera, and can play a role so that when these upsurges start, there are people around with political ideas and political experience that can push forward democratic self-organization, assemblies, greater militancy, greater solidarity, et cetera. Thanks. Thank you both. Um, I have a, two questions that have come in from Jennifer over email. So the first question is, would you all say that racism and especially anti-Black racism is a part of the crisis the pandemic has unleashed? Why or why not? And the second is, how can we respond in an impactful way towards the crisis we are talking about today? Okay. Um, I'll go the same order. Um, <laughs> Um, yes, I mean, I think the, uh, there is absolutely no question that, the, uh, that in this crisis, the issue of anti-black racism, uh, I mean, certainly racism in general, but, but anti-black racism with its particularities has manifested itself strongly in the, uh, in the Canadian context uh, at every point in terms of as the uh, the lockdowns take place and the measures of physical distancing are enforced, they're enforced on a thoroughly racist basis, utterly and completely, with anti-black racism being the most egregious form of, uh, form of that manifestation of that. Um, it's certainly true in terms of, uh, it's certainly in, ter in terms of who's at risk who's at risk in terms of health outcomes. Uh, you go up to some of the neighborhoods where the overwhelmingly racialized and very largely black workers uh, who have to work in the precarious, in the precarious uh, uh, so-called essential worker component, and you watch them crowding onto death trap buses uh, during shift change times, and you understand uh, who's absolutely at risk. And, Let's also recognize, I think, that um, let's also recognize that the upsurge that came out of the United States following the murder of George Floyd saw really powerful mobilizations uh, 
challenging anti-black racism uh, in, uh, in Canada. Um, and in the struggles that lay ahead, uh, anti-racist struggles in general and anti-black racism fights in particular are, of, are going to be central to all the issues that, are, that emerge in terms of workplace struggles. Uh, if you look at evictions, if you look at the eviction situation, um, so disproportionately amongst the 30, 35,000 households that I talked about that are facing the immediate threat of eviction, it's going to be, it's going to be black people. In fact, I think the, uh, the uh, racial justice component of the struggle that lies ahead is going to be greater than ever. And that's the, uh, that, that's the simple reality. And uh, in terms of uh, the second question was a rather general one about responding to the crisis. And I suppose we've, 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 uh, we've covered uh, to the best of our ability, some of those, and there's more questions to be answered than there are answers at this, uh, at this point. But we've got to, what we have, I think, is an explosive sense of anger and indignation and uncertainty and fear. That, that exists, right? Address it at the level of consciousness. It's generally, it's an axiomatic thing that consciousness lags behind being. Uh, but there are times when all of a sudden consciousness just leaps. And uh, I think uh, we want to fan the flames of that. I think we want to actually see that leap in consciousness uh, take place and take the organizational forms and struggle and forms of struggle that it, that it needs to. But uh, I, I think we can, we can say this is a time of enormous hardship and uncertainty. We can say this is a time of enormous danger, but those times are always the times of the greatest possibilities as well. So I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a need to feel a sense of uh, pessimism. I think there's a need to feel a sense of not uh, giggly and ridiculous, but, uh, but very firmly rooted and thoroughly justified optimism. Um, John's gave, you know, just tremendously good detailed examples of how, ra how ra racism and particularly anti-black racism in Canada and in the US have manifested itself during the crisis. For me, this is just a, another manifestation of the fact that capitalism as a social and economic system necessarily constantly produces and reproduces racialized divisions amongst working people. Capitalist accumulation and competition constantly differentiate workers, employed, unemployed, better paid, worse paid, et cetera, et cetera. And the way in which capitalists organize this competition among workers and workers do when collective organization, class against class organization is weak, is often on the level of race, which means, as John put it, anti-racist demands, struggles, forms of organization, et cetera, are gonna be crucial to any resistance today. And I think that in terms of, I agree with John that this is a period of both opportunity, but it's also a period of danger because he is absolutely right. Wrong broad sections of the population, well beyond work, working class people, among the small business people, among the lower levels, of managers, supervisors, et cetera. There's a tremendous level of fear, anxiety, economic and social precarity, et cetera. The question will be, will that anger be directed at other working people, which has fueled the growth of the populist right and its fascist minority, minority within that, or will it be built on a class and so a solidaristic class against class basis, which must include anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-homophobic politics. And in terms concretely in the US, there are several areas where the left should be spending 99.9% .9 of its activity. And none of those are elections. We saw in the midst of almost 20% unemployment, job actions and workplace resist workplace demonstrations in the height of the pandemic. We're seeing a attempts at organizing the strategically crucial logistics industry. The left should be relating to this and helping workers organize themselves. They need to be related to that among teachers, nurses, all the frontline workers, 
organizing around, particularly in this conjuncture, issues of health and safety, the availability of PPE, et cetera. Secondly, there's the arena in which we must be fighting, which is gonna be around housing and unemployment, which uh, John has much more experience doing in Canada than I have in the US. We haven't seen, we don't have an OCAP in the US and that's a real handicap for our left. But we need to revive this sort of spirit of the unemployed workers movements of the thirties, which attempt to, which attempt to address the, which organize direct action against evictions for greater uh, relief for the unemployed, et cetera. A third, the third area is a continued agitation and, edu and organizing around defunding the police. And finally, we need to begin, revive what we did in 2017 in several big cities in the US, Boston in particular, after Charlottesville. Massive demonstrations. Every time the Proud Boys or these other fascist gangs show up, they are outnumbered, overwhelmed, and eventually dispersed. So those are the very concrete areas where we as the left need to be orienting in the coming period. Thank you, John and Charlie. Um, so I have two more questions and I'll read them both and, and these will be the last questions. And um, just in the, on the issue of of racial justice and racism and anti-Black racism. Um, the next panel on February 22nd at 11 is on struggles for racial justice with panels, panelists Regine Hoylett, Haley Pesson, and Wanda Wipert. And I encourage everyone to come to that. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so the first question is from Luann and she asks, my observation is that social movements and the left in general have, in some cases, become increasingly fractured, even to the point of identity groups turning on each other. A commitment to the social or to concerns that are framed, sorry, not framed in their own terms is often weak. I have wondered if this is the neoliberalization of the left. However, people we, sorry, perhaps we, see a shift resulting from the events of the past year with the BLM movement, for example, for greater cohesion. What opportunities do you, John and Charlie, see in this moment to reinvigorate a commitment to the social, to a common good and a shared responsibility? Perhaps John can expand on his optimism in this time and how to build <laughs> on that. Um, and then Gary asks, um, we are dealing with racist and settler colonial capitalism in this pandemic. What is the significance of indigenous struggles and climate justice, um, sorry, climate justice struggles given the mediated crisis we're facing now? And then a subsequent question from Gary, what are the major limitations of public health ideology and practices for us now and problems with flattening the curve as opposed to zero COVID strategy from below. So I hope you got all of those. Uh, we'll give you a few minutes to respond um, to those three kind of uh, quite different, but um, very comprehensive and very important questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, um, I mean, I think I think the fracturing that uh, Luan speaks of within movements is certainly a very real phenomenon. Um, and I do think it reflects, I do think it reflects the pressure of, uh, of the period that we've come through and the shock of the immediate period. I think those things are all certainly and absolutely true. Um, I mean, in a modest way, uh, sort of see this panel series as an opportunity to begin to have some of the discussions necessary that I think have to be have to be taken forward in this period. I think it's a period in which there is a need to really uh, deepen an understanding of what's going on, um, but not to do so in an abstract way. Uh, 
we need to do it as we go. We need to do it in terms of the struggles that are being taken up, uh, because by you know sitting on Zoom and, uh, and pontificating about uh, about various things by itself, we achieve very very little. The question is 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 to what extent the what we're saying relevant, and to what extent is it being tested in practice in the in 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 social movement in social movement struggles, and then what do we draw back from those struggles? So I think we have uh, we have a, a, a period in which we're in a period in which there is a real possibility to develop the kind of orientation and perspective that can make a real difference that can influence what's that can influence what's going on in really really in really really uh, positive ways um with regards to the question of optimism um you know it's uh, i get a bit uh, a bit like gramsci i suppose when it comes to the question of uh, the question of optimism I, I i i'm certainly not in a position to make a prediction that we're not going to suffer horrendous defeats in the period that lie ahead but i do think that when you look at the situation when you do look at the upsurge that's taken the the, the upsurges that have taken place it's really unfortunate that kavita was not able to join us today and talk about what's going on in india where uh, a veritable uh, inhuman laboratory of neoliberalism is being is being actually challenged by a mobilization of Indian farmers. And before that, it was a general strike. So this is a time when there's a, a real, I think, a real mood and a real consciousness, and it's manifesting itself in very, very real mass struggles. So that's an incredible amount of raw material to work with. It's not enough to achieve a change in society but it gives us something incredible to work with. So I think that's really, really significant. Um, with regards to, um, with regards to questions of, uh, of the settler colonial nature of Canadian society, I think, I think without, uh, without a shadow of doubt um, that all of the contradictions at play within that society are uh, intensified by this, uh, by this crisis. Uh, the social abandonment and the injustices, uh, the police violence, and all of those things that Indigenous people face. And when Wanda speaks next week, uh, we've asked that she speak specifically about, uh, about the role of the RCMP as a colonial police force within Canadian society, but to talk broadly about, about the issues uh, emerging uh, within within indigenous communities. And, and as a general proposition, when we begin this with a land acknowledgement, uh, if we're talking about challenging this society and building a better one, uh, decolonization must be absolutely at the, at the forefront of what we're, we're talking about. We're not gonna challenge anything in the society if we don't challenge the fundamental uh, uh, really genocidal. Even even Justin Trudeau acknowledges that the uh, the genocidal basis on which this on which this was all created. So that's I think fundamental. Climate justice, uh, yes. Climate justice. The struggle for climate justice is if there's an interwoven series of crises. If magically tomorrow one of those vaccines just gave us all herd immunity and it all went away, and Michael Roberts was completely wrong and the eco the economy bounced back, we would still we would still be facing uh, 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 an absolutely existential crisis uh, that is not actually just climate; it's a broader ecological crisis of habitat destruction, species extinction, pollution, all of those things. We, we really are living in a, in a, under a social and economic system that has proven itself incapable of building a sustainable relationship with the planet we live on. And that has incredible implications. And in some ways, it's the ultimate crisis that has to be, uh, not just in some ways, it actually is the ultimate crisis that has to be, uh, that has to be addressed. Um, with regards to the zero COVID strategy, I think it is absolutely uh, important and vital and the effect of the mutant strains, I think, is going to increase the, the, the seriousness of that, that we cannot go through this uh, unending cycle of trying to alleviate it to the point where there's some possibility of making profits and then sending people back out there to die. Uh, there has to be a fight for, uh, for, for, for measures of physical distancing, and it has to come from uh, workers, and it has to come from communities, and it has to be actually struggled for. But of course, it has to also be linked for uh, 
uh, we can't have lockdowns so that people are thrown out onto the streets. We can't have lockdowns that are based on uh, people going hungry. Uh, we have to fight for, we have to, it has to be a, a zero COVID, but also a, a fight for basic and necessary provision taken up at the same time. And if we had a healthy movement in this, uh, in this country, and I don't, that's not a failing only in Canada, but if we had a, a healthy movement that was capable of leading the kind of struggles necessary, the zero, zero COVID strategy, you know, when, when Doug Ford gets up and yammers on about it's safe to do this and it's safe to do that, there would be mass demonstrations. There would be, there would be a, a refusal by communities to, to do it. There would be strikes. There would be, people would not accept this kind of deathly, uh, uh, game that we're going through at the moment. So yes, absolutely, zero COVID is essential. Um, I'll start with the last question because I think John covered 99.9% .9 of what I would want to say. I also think that we need to be, in terms of a zero COVID strategy, pointing out that the market as a mechanism of economic regulation is completely and utterly incapable of dealing with social crises like the pandemic. And that in order for zero COVID to become real, we need, and in order for physical distancing, in the states we call it social distancing, et cetera, to actually work, people must have guaranteed housing, health care, income, et cetera. If not, there's going to be there's going to be building a movement from below to keep workplaces shut, et cetera, is gonna be much harder if people are on the verge of starvation, eviction, et cetera. In terms of both the indigenous justice struggles and the climate ecological struggles, both of those, at least in the States, have been on, have taken a sort of back seat in the last eight or nine months to a series of other struggles. However, as the pandemic, it comes, quote, under control, both of these issues, both are going to be very, very sharply posed because the Biden-Harris administration is as committed to tapping to an extractivist natural resource strategy for as part of trying to revive capitalist accumulation in the US as was Trump, Obama, et cetera. We will see again new pipelines, new attempts to, uh, to find collaborators among, indi among indigenous communities in the US to go along with extraction, et cetera. And these struggles will be revived. And I think that the even after the pandemic is quote contained, there's going to be a growing consciousness and activity around the fact that the same factors, the same social system that has created the climate in general ecological crisis is also producing continuous pandemics. Now, the last point in terms of a fractured left, I think that there has been a neoliberalization and NGO, non-government organizationization of the left under neoliberalism. With the decline of unions, with the conservatization of the social democratic and labor parties, with the disappearance of a, a radical far left, with the decline of the social movements of the oppressed, we saw more and more of these middle-class elements emerging within these communities emerging and basically attempting to situate themselves and advance their own social positions at the expense with little regard for the needs of working class people of color, working class queers, women, et cetera, often at the, and in a, in a competition for scarce state and corporate resources, developing various forms of what Assad, transforming identity politics as Assad Hayers pointed out from an attempt to link struggles against oppression and exploitation into basically liberal a politics. Now, I think John is, and I think there are signs that this is starting to break down as new, particularly working class and younger layers of people begin to involve, engage in struggle. The, one of the most striking features of the anti-racist uprising 
of last spring and summer was its multiracial character. This was the mo one of the most, not only the largest, but one of the most racially integrated social movements of the last 60 or 70 years in the United States. Th the fact that we're seeing non-white workers in the leads of many of the struggles, whether it's in healthcare, whether it's in the logistics industry, et cetera, is a very, very hopeful sign. Now, for the, the conscious left that's playing, trying to play a role in cohering a militant minority of activists and organizers out of this, we can't fall back on, and what I see, particularly in the US left, I can't speak for the Canadian left, is the idea that, okay, we got rid of identity politics and the way to maintain unity and solidarity is going for simply universal demands, the lowest common denominator, and not take up the demands of the most oppressed. That is a formula both for renewed divisions among working people and the revival of the hegemony of narrow liberal identity politics that we need to avoid and push back against. I'm done. Thank you so much, Charlie. Um, I just wanna thank both of you again. That was very informative. I learned a lot. I know if this was a live panel that there would be a huge amount of applause. Um, I maybe should have had a soundboard hmm. to mimic that, um, but I'm sure everyone here is applauding in their hearts. Um, thank you both. I welcome everyone to join us again on February 22nd for Struggles in Racial Justice, and we'll just end it there. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, AJ.